Yes, so I'm Tor Lilqvist, and I have been working on this uh, iOS app, mainly for the iPad, but it runs also on, on the iPhone. Uh, but it isn't really very useful on that because of the small screen and hasn't much been tested. Uh, let me see. I'll attach this so I can show some stuff later. Uh, first, a bit about Collabora, but you probably know most of this already, so I won't go into details. Here's a picture from the natural park where we were on, on Tuesday. Uh, Cross-compiling LibreOffice. My talk overlaps quite much with Candy's, so I will try to skip those things that Candy already mentioned, and hopefully I can mention something that Candy didn't <laughs> mention. Like when you build uh, the LibreOffice score code for for iOS or for Android, uh, what happens is that you run the configure script twice, or it's, it gets run automatically twice, separately for the build machine, uh, for iOS that is then a Mac, and separately for the runtime platform or host, as, as autoconfig calls it. Uh, and for the build platform, for the Mac, that is, we only build those tools that are needed while, while building the code for the actual target device. And like for Android, we only uh, build static archives, no dynamic libraries. And the reason for this is similar to the situation on, as it was on Android. It used to be that on iOS, an app cannot load any own dynamic libraries at all. Uh, that has been relaxed afterwards, or, or re has been relaxed now, but uh, I haven't bothered changing this. And that it might be that to load a dynamic library, it has to be in this framework format. That it, can't, it can't be just a normal dynamic library. And of course, there isn't really any unit testing going on when when cross-compiling. And the core repo itself does not have any, any iOS app code. Well, there is one, but it's obsolete and probably doesn't work. And history, as Kendi already told much of this, uh, one iOS-specific detail here, here is that uh, there was this Cloudon comp company that that in 2014, I think it was, they wanted to, to build, or they had an application for iOS, and they wanted to use uh, LibreOffice in that. And, uh, but, and lots of work was done for that, but then the company was acquired, and this really didn't go in much further then. Uh, and this, this is actually where, where Candy told you that something actually did happen in between. So this is not actually true that not much happened. <laughs> uh, we had a, a test app for iOS that was kept working, more or less, and then also Jan Iversen, who worked for TDF for a time, did another, another approach, but that did not finish. And then, as Candy mentioned, in 2018, or was it even earlier, the idea to use uh, the Collabora online code base for, for this kind of app was introduced, and, and it uses both the C++ code from online and also the JavaScript user interface. And thanks to Nicholas and Adfidis for funding this stuff. And LibreOffice Kit, as you know, probably it originally was meant to, use, to be used mainly for tasks like loading and saving documents in different formats. 
And then later, this tile rendering concept was added to it. Uh, and this was done for, for online, wasn't it, originally? And then the Cloudon, Cloudon app also used that to get the document rendered. About Collabora Online, when it's run like in the normal online way, it has several processes. There is one master process, WSD, for WebSocket daemon. There is one broker process, and then for each document being open, but open by uh, one or several users, there is one kit process. Uh, and then the, each browser or each user runs lots of JavaScript in, in their client or in their browser. And the communication between uh, the browser and, and the server process uses WebSockets, which is a quite thin layer on top of, of TCP sockets. And also the communication between these processes on the server is using WebSockets. And here is the city hall in Malaga, very nice building. And then if you want to combine all this into one iOS app, uh, you need to run both the, or have both the core LibreOffice code and also the C++ code from online in the same process and also some native iOS code for handling all the interface between these bits and, and the JavaScript and so on. And this uh, platform specific code is, is written in Objective-C or Objective-C++. Uh, it could be Swift also, but uh, it seemed easier to use Objective-C and Objective-C++ because then you can easier use these LibreOffice Kit APIs directly. And I don't know, didn't know Swift then yet. The HTML page of online and all the JavaScript runs in a WebKit web view. Uh, and actually each such web view is, is for safety reasons a separate process, but you don't really notice that when coding. Check the time, by the way, yeah. And this is more or less like on, like Candy just described for Android. The APIs are called a bit differently, but it uses basically the same the same mechanisms to talk between the JavaScript and the native code. And also, uh, the, the thing that would be, that in normal online is between the processes, the WSD and broker and kit processes that doesn't use any, any uh, sockets or other things, but uses simple in-process buffers and, and stuff like that. Yeah, well, Candy told about Android already, and there is also a very simple GTK Plus app that can be used if you want to check this out, but don't have any, any mobile device or, or want to just use your Linux machine for it. Uh, when you build the core LibreOffice, all these static libraries, uh, are put in a file or a list of their names, and that is then used when linking the app in Xcode. And uh, as we don't do any dynamic linking, all the mapping from, from a UNO component name or constructor name or whatever to, to actual, fun actual code has to be through a, a static map. And here is how the file list or list of these libraries looks a part of it. And here is the, 
the linker command line that Xcode generates the thing in, in bold, bold there in the middle is the file list that is passed to it. And here is part of the core code that does the uh, calls the function pointer it has looked up, it looks up from the map. Let, and that's Alhambra. Um, and these uh, maps from you know component names to to function pointers is generated by the, by a Python script. Uh, this script is a bit ad hoc written and always when you notice that something is, is missing at runtime, when you run the app, you need to add one more line to, to that script. But otherwise, for instance, all the config configuration files, the RC files, exist in the app more or less like in normal LibreOffice. And here, for instance, you see what the Python script uses. It, it has this list of, of library names and the corresponding uh, you know, component uh, creation function. And more of the same and blah, blah, blah. And this is for the, for the uh, welded, no, this is for the non-welded widgets or uh, controls. Oops. Well, there is some tapas. <laughs> I missed one slide. Yeah, but now it's the same. Yeah. Uh, then I thought I would show some code also. Let's see what time it is. Well, I can do something, show something. When it starts, it needs to Initialize various things. Let me start Xcode. Oh, let's stop this first. Hmm. Or maybe it's not a good idea to show so much code. Let me just just continue this. Uh, the initial initialization uh, is not very complicated. The interesting thing is that when it creates this uh, object that corresponds to the WSD process in real online. It just starts a thread that creates such an object and lets it run, and when it exits, it creates a new one and runs that, and so on. Uh, when the app starts, it shows you first the document browser, and at least on iOS, this was very trivial to do because you can use the system libraries to get this for free, kind of. And you can browse uh, local files or, or files on any, any so-called, was it file storage, storage extension or file storage provider or something. So that if you have, for instance, installed Nextcloud on your iOS device, you can browse also documents in Nextcloud and the same for own cloud, I guess, and also documents in, in this uh, iCloud drive that are shared then with, with your Macs and iOS devices. They all show up. Mm -hmm. And when a document then is selected, it creates a controller for this and uh, uh, and the name of the document or the URL of it is passed to this, this HTML file that then loads all the JavaScript. And uh, then the actual startup of this uh, 
application is a bit complicated because it has to correspond to what happens in the browser in normal online where, you, where the code, JavaScript code sends a separate a GET request, but there is no... Uh, well, anyway, it's, it's not really the same, but it looks more or less the same for, from, most, from the point of view of most of the JavaScript code. And uh, this send, send to JS and uh, function is what uh, sends uh, a message to the JavaScript. It's as, as Kendi described for, for the Android app. It executes one line of, of JavaScript or one expression. Yeah, and in this file you have the code that receives these uh, messages that the JavaScript code invokes in, in the app native code. The HTML file is actually generated from an M4 file, which is quite interesting, but it's mostly the same as in normal online. This M4 is used to get some conditional context, content, contents into it. Mm. Localization of the app is much different from normal online because we have all the localizations all the time available. Uh, the, all the uh, translated strings are are combined in, into one one JavaScript structure that's part of the code that is loaded. While in normal online, it does the translations at runtime from the server, I think. Or maybe, no, no it does so that it loads the, only the translation actually used by the user for his language. And here is some details about this. The same fake web sockets are used here also. Compared to normal online on a mobile device, we use a bit more. We have more screen real estate to use, and uh, for instance, the menu bar is shown all the time, and uh, the toolbar is at the top, while on the iPhone or on Android phones, it's on the bottom. Uh, and some of the things that the JavaScript does in normal online using HTTP cannot use that in an app because there is no web server involved. So these have then have to be handled differently. And when you build the app, it's uh, uh, several steps. First, you build the core repository parts. And this produces these static archives. And then at the moment when I build the JavaScript bits, I do it on a Linux machine because I didn't want to install some NPM and whatever things on my Mac without knowing <laughs> how, how, how much they will disturb my other stuff or possibly corrupt my environment or whatever. So I do that on a, on a Linux machine, but it could be on the, do, done on the Mac also. And this generates one bundle.js that is then copied over to the Mac. And the uh, online C++ and Objective-C parts are compiled just in Xcode using the normal click-at-click -click mechanism. And debugging this is uh, quite easy, actually. You can debug it in inside Xcode where you have built it, and you can set breakpoints in the core code or in the Objective-C code. Uh, if you want to debug the JavaScript code, 
you need to use the Mac for that. And if you have the iPad connected to your Mac, well, as you must have if you're, when you run Xcode on the Mac, you can just use the develop menu in Safari, and you will see the name of your iPad and the name of the HTML page being showed, shown in the app. And then you can browse the, the JavaScript code and set breakpoints and so on. And you notice when you get uncaught exceptions. And that's all. Thank you.